Yep. Matthew chapter 16, we're going to look at the first four verses tonight. The Bible says in, in verse number 1, The Pharisees also with the Sadducees came, and tempting desired him that he would show them a sign from heaven. And he answered and said unto them, When it is evening, ye say, It will be fair weather, for the sky is red. And in the morning it will be foul weather today, for the sky is red and lowering. O oh, ye hypocrites, ye can discern the face of the sky, but you cannot discern the signs of the times. A wicked and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign, but there shall, be, there shall no sign be given unto it, but the sign of the prophet Jonas. And he left them and departed. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your goodness and mercy. Help us, dear Lord, as we turn to your word tonight. And dear Lord, help me as I preach your word. Give me the very things that I need tonight. And dear Lord, help me to say things in a clear way. And dear Lord, I pray that everybody's understanding would be open. Their heart and mind would be open unto your word. And may everything that we say and do tonight go to honor and to glorify you. For it's in Christ's name we pray. And amen. When we look at this verse, and I'm going to preach on this thought, the signs of the times. The signs of the times. He said the Sadducees and Pharisees came to him, trying to tempt him, asking that he would show them a sign. You know, we're no different than what they were in those days. We want to come to God and ask God to do something special, something miraculous, so we know that He's working in our lives or that maybe even we're saved or just do something in this person's life so they will know that uh, there is a God in heaven that they need to get saved. We want to tempt God in those things. But just as then, God tells us, Look at the signs of the times. Look at what you see around us. Today, religious people are always looking for a sign. The charismatic movement looks for the sign of tongues or slain in the spirit or, or all that stuff that has nothing to do with biblical principles today. If slain in the spirit has nothing to do with biblical principles at all. But they say that's a sign that you're saved. You're hard-pressed to find that in the Bible. Very hard-pressed, because you won't. They wanted proof here in the passage of who he was. And you know, that's what people want today. They want proof of who God is. Well, why would a God, a loving God, allow all this stuff that's going in the world to happen? You know, there's no doubt someone would say today, why would a loving God allow that bombing in New York last night? Or yesterday, whenever it was. Why would they allow that? A loving God, in most people's mind, wouldn't allow something like that. They say that's a sign that there is no God. The point is, they're looking for a sign. He answered them by basically saying anyone that can read the signs of the skies should be able to read the signs of the time. Now, one of the big difference we have between them is we have a completed word of God where they didn't. We can know the signs of the times by looking at what's going on around us and comparing it to Scripture. They didn't have that luxury. You see, even saved people will ask sometimes what is going on. They don't understand. Think of John the Baptist. 
In Matthew chapter 11, the first six verses, it says that it came to pass when Jesus had made an end of commanding his twelve disciples, he departed thence to teach and preach in their cities. Now when John had heard in the prison the works of Christ, he sent two of his disciples and said unto him, Art thou he that should come, or do we look for another? Excuse me. He said, do we look for another? John was seeking a sign here. He wanted to know for sure. And I have no doubt he was saved. Why? Behold the Son of God, the Lamb of God that taketh away the sins of the world. He's the one that said it. I'm the voice of the one crying in the wilderness. There's one that cometh after me whose sandals I am not worthy to loose. He's the one that made those claims. He claimed this is he that I've been talking about. But yet, at the end of his life, he said, Are you the one or should we look at another? Notice what Jesus says. Jesus answered and said unto them, Go and show John again those things which ye do, what? Hear and see. What do you hear? I hope you're hearing the Word of God preached. Amen? Amen. What do you see? I hope you're reading your Bible. But at that time, they were with the Word. Amen? So they heard and saw things in person. Notice, he says, the blind receive their sight. The lame walk. The lepers are cleansed. The deaf hear. The dead are raised up. And the poor have the gospel preached unto them. He said, you see everything you need to see. His, John's disciples saw all of this. Because he told them, go and tell him what you see. What you hear. They saw all of this. But yet they, they came from John asking this question. The reality of it is, they should have never had to come to John. Or to Christ. When John asked a question, they should have said, listen John, let me tell you what I saw. Let me tell you what I heard. They already had everything they needed. They didn't need nothing new. And by the way, we already have everything that we need. We need nothing new. Amen. The signs of the time. We just need to read our Bible. Listen, reading the Bible will turn your doubts into certainties. Amen? Amen. Reading the Bible will turn your doubts into certainties. Amen. It'll help you to understand. You see, when we look at the sequence of events found in the Bible, you find out first how you got there. The sin in the world and, and everything, as you look at and you study, especially in time prophecies, you stop and you look back at the world and you look at the progression of the world. And I've been talking about this progression for a long time, how it's getting worse and worse. And by the way, the Bible says, evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse. Amen? Amen. The world wax worse and worse. We see rampantness as far as sin and the disregard for the things of God. I mean, you live in a place where you can go and buy Bibles in this city in a number of different places. Maybe not the Bible you want, but there's Bibles out there. And you can buy them, and we have kids who don't even know the name of Jesus. 
You have parents who don't care about Jesus. You have kids running around that never give the afterlife a second thought. But yet we have what? 15, 20 churches in the immediate area. And I'm not saying they're good Bible preaching churches. I'm saying they're things that cause themselves churches. And we have this in this area. That doesn't even include the things that's closed. The signs of the times. You see how we got here. We see in the Bible where we go from here. How is it that we got this to this place? The reason is is because God's people don't spend time in the Word of God. They don't understand what's going on. Listen, no doubt there are probably some saved in some of these other churches. I, I'm not going to say they're all lost. Although probably a good portion of them are because what they teach concerning salvation. You have, what, you have what I would call accidentals, amen? They get saved in spite of the place they're at. But they don't know their Bible, and because they don't know their Bible, they don't understand what's going on in the world. They think it's what it's supposed to be. By the way, it is what it's supposed to be, but they don't understand how bad that is. If we did realize how much there is in the Scriptures relating to the second coming of Christ, there is without question that we would see God has a road map of getting us from where we are to where we will be. The signs of the time. When you study the book of Revelation... You see a basic five point road map from now to eternity. You see, first, the rapture of the church, talked about in Revelation 4 1, where God says, Come up hither. That's what we call the first advent of the second coming. The Lord Jesus, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, we looked at it this morning, is going to come to the clouds, blow the trumpet, and we go out of here. That's the next thing on God's calendar. We see that. We see all the events leading up to that. We anticipate that. God's Word says we should be looking for it. But the, you know what? The world hates the Word of God. And if you would go down, I, I know when Miss Stella came, I, I started talking about the rapture. And she was like, what's that? she never heard of it before. Well, the word rapture is not in the Bible. No. But Playboy is not in the Bible either. But the principles taught that you shouldn't be messing with it. Just because a certain word is not in there doesn't mean the principle is not taught. And the principle of the rapture is taught in 1 Thessalonians. Also, I showed you in 1 Corinthians, and it's even mentioned in Romans. So we have the principle of the rapture taught. And it's mentioned in the book of Revelation. We have that principle taught, but there's people in this world that claim to be Christians that reject it. Now listen, if they're truly saved, they're going to be surely shocked if they're alive when the rapture happens. There's going to be a lot of people saying, Boy, I wish I'd have listened to Pastor Smith, or I wish I'd have listened to Claude, or Marie Ange, or, or whoever. They're going to be like, whoo, what happened? How did I get here? Hey, you know that thing you rejected I tried to tell you about? Yeah. There's a lot more things about to happen that you rejected I tried to tell you about. I'm sure there's going to be people shocked and surprised. 
But why is that? Because people fail to read their Bible. The second thing we see in the Bible taught, first you're going to have the rapture, then you're going to have the ruin. The ruin starts from Revelation 4 and verse 2 and goes through chapter 18. This is a, the tribu what we call the tribulation period. It really has two aspects. It has the first part, uh, I, I guess you can call it a tribu the tribulation period. Then you have the great tribulation, the second half. Listen, I wouldn't want to be in the first half, let alone the second. But the Bible clearly teaches it. And you know what? People reject it. Most people don't even want to read the book of Revelations or teach it. You know that's odd? That is a, a, a very odd thing when you consider what it says. Look with me in Revelation chapter 1. When you get there, say amen. Well, there's a few. I'm waiting for a few more. Amen. Revelation chapter 1 and verse 3. Blessed is he that readeth and they that hear the words of this prophecy. And keep those things which are written therein, for the time is in the future? No, it says for the time is at hand. So many people, they're scared to death to look at the book of Revelation. It's not revelations, plural. It's revelation, singular. It's all one revelation. They're scared to death. But the Bible says, Blessed is he that heareth and readeth this. Show me another book in the Bible that says that. This is the only book that people are warned against reading. Why are they warned against it? Because they reject the Bible. They reject the Bible. They don't want to teach you what it says. They don't want you to know the Word of God because if you understand that book, listen, you're going to get right with God. But people don't want it. This is the ruin. I mean, listen. The people that will be killed just in one plague. A third of the earth is killed. Think about that. We're well, well over 7 billion people in the world. That's over 2 billion people. 2.333, continue, billion people die in one act of God. And it doesn't stop there. That's just one time that people die. People die throughout this thing. Listen, the population of the earth by the time the end of the tri tribulation comes around is going to be well below a billion. I have no doubt in that whatsoever. By the time the end of the thing is done, all these people going around talking about... Uh, I think I've mentioned this before down... I believe it's in Georgia... They um, have this big, I think it's the Ten Commandments for the New World or something like that. And one of the things is dropping the world population below a billion. They're going to get their wish, but only they're not going to have to do what God is. You know why I think Satan put it in their hearts to do it? Because during that tribulation when he's reigning, he's going to say, See, this is what should happen. I've caused all this. He's going to be trying to steal God's thunder. But listen, in the end, it ain't going to happen. Remember, at the end, when 
uh, Christ comes back and you have that great battle, the Bible says the valley of Armageddon, Megiddo, is going to run with blood at the height of a horse's bridle. A river of blood about this high. From the stage to about there. You know how many dead bodies that would take? Any science major, I don't think we haven't, but anybody know how much blood is in a body? Huh? Seven liters? That sounds like an awful lot. I don't know. Two gallon? Wow. Even if, if it's two gallon, you imagine a valley, and, and the valley of Megiddo is l broad. There's going to be over a million people in this battle. Okay? Two gallons times a, a, two million gallons is not a, that much water. I, I mean, there's probably two million gallons of water in our bay out here. I, I'm talking before the bridge, before it goes out past Bathurst. We're talking a lot. So we, we see here, when we look at the book of Revelation in those um, 16, 17 chapters right there, that's a lot. Or not 16, 17, 4, 5, 15 chapters. The death toll is going to be unreal. But you know, most people don't know that. They're serving a loving God that would not hurt a fly. Listen, when you hear someone say that, you, guarantee, you can guarantee it. They've never heard the book of Revelation preached. And that is a sign of the times. Why can't we see the sign of the times? Because we refuse to read His Word. In the, book, in the chapter 19... We see the third part, the return. Listen, that's when we come back as the Lone Ranger. You can come back as Lone Rangerette, amen? But you won't be Lone Rangerette because by the time you get there, you're going to have your new bodies. We're going to be changed in a moment, twinkling eye. We'll be as the angels. There's not going to be sex. Not be male and female. Not be given in marriages. I, listen, what it is, I don't know. That's a mystery unto me. I can just tell you what the Bible says. We'll be as the angels, not marrying or giving in marriage. I don't know how it's going to be. But we'll all be coming back. How many of you have never ridden a horse? Guess what? You're going to ride one one day. <laughs> And, and you won't fall off. You won't be scared. Every th Listen. Hey, let me help you out. We, I, I talk all the time about how when we get our new bodies, listen, we're not going to have any aches and pains. There'll be no spirit of fear. There'll be no anxiety. There'll be no anger. I mean, uh, you, you hear me talking about the aches and pains and we forget about that aspect of our lives. All that's going to be gone. You'll be bold. You'll sing out. There'll no, be no more. Amen. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Thank God. Amen. Amen. I think we'll be more like what we should be now. Then we see in Revelation 20, the rain, Christ reigning. 
And you know what? That all this blows me. There's people that that believe. Listen. Hey, we're already in the millennium. And that's what it's talking about in, in, in chapter 20, the millennium. We're already in it. And I ask him, I, okay, we're already in the millennium. Okay, in order to be at Revelation 20, we had to go through the others. Show me in history where all that has happened. It hasn't. So what do they do? They say, oh, that's not real. It's just stories. Do you not believe the Bible is the Word of God? What are you basing your faith on? Stories or something that is fact? Hey, if Jesus' death on the cross was just a story, you're not, as we read this morning, you're still in your sin. It's fact. But you know what? People choose, pick and choose what is factual and what they think is allegorical. In other words, it's just a story to teach something. Listen, the book of Revelation is no allegory. It's real. It is coming. You don't want to be a part of it. You don't... Listen, I, I don't mean to scare you, but you don't want your family to be a part of it. This is no laughing, joking matter. But you know what the world does? They laugh and joke about it. People that call themselves Christian laugh and joke about us because we believe that these things are going to happen. They haven't happened yet. Show me a time in the world where every body of water was turned to blood. It's going to happen. It talks about it. Show me a time in the world where all crops, all vegetation throughout the world is destroyed by plagues. It's going to happen. I mean, people's going to be dying left and right just because of the plagues where God touches the earth, just like He did in the book of Revelation or in Exodus with Egypt, except on a worldwide scale. No, it's not happened yet. No, He is not reigning. If you think God is reigning in this world, believe me, you are blind. And you're willingly blind. But then we see in chapters 21 and 22 the restoration. So we see by prophecy there's, going to, there's a five-part plan to God in what's about to happen. How do we know these things? By studying His Word. Seeing the signs of the time as it relates to the Word of God. That's what we need to be doing. Now we're going to be taking over the, the next couple of months and looking at all these different signs and, and all the things that are going on. You see, people make a mistake when they read passages like Luke 21, 21 through 26, where it says, Then let them which are in Judea flee to the mountains, and let them which are in the midst of it depart out, and let not them that are in the countries enter therein too. For those be the days of vengeance that all, thi all things that are written may be fulfilled. God says, those things that's been written, those things of the Old Testament prophets, and we're going to be studying over the next few months what the Old Testament prophets said, they're going to be fulfilled. He says, but woe unto them that are with child, and to them that gave suck in those days. For there shall be great distress in the land, and wrath upon, notice, 
this people. What people? You know what? People take this and say, oh, he's talking about Christians. Are you ludicrous? Christ hadn't died yet. Who's he talking to? The Jews. He's saying there's going to be great distress on the Jews. When does God distress the Jews again? Hey, listen, it wasn't 70 A.D. when they was kicked out of Israel. And it wasn't the time when uh, Hitler was massacring all the Jews. That wasn't it. You look, remember, the tribulation period, God is not dealing with heathens. The purpose of the tribulation is the Jews. It is the 70th week of Daniel. We're going to look at that and tie that in. But it's that period where God once again deals with the Jews before He sets up His kingdom. He's got to deal with them before He comes in rules and reigns. He says, all of that is for this people. And they shall fall by the edge of the sword, and thou shalt be led away captive into all nations, and Jerusalem shall be trodden down uh, of the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. We see that part of it's already done. Or about to be concluded. The times of the Gentiles... And there shall be signs in the sun and in the moons and in the stars and upon the earth distresses of nations and perplexity, the sea and the roaring waves, men's heart failing them for fear and looking after those things which are coming on the earth for the powers of heaven shall be shaken." You see, he tells them, he's telling the Jews, listen, things are going to come upon you now. There's going to be a times of the Gentile. The times of the Gentile was from when Christ was killed on the cross of Calvary until the tribulation starts or the rapture happens, which is going to be simultaneously. When we're taken out, the tribulation period starts. It's the same time. That's why God tells us, listen, that He's going to keep us from the wrath to come. Talking about Christians. We're told that, I think, three or four times in the New Testament. We're going to be spared from the wrath to come. Listen, that means that we don't have to go through it. Let me help you. That means it will be a pre-tribulational rapture. So many people want to take and say mid-trib. Listen, if you want to go through part of the tribulation, you go right ahead. But my Bible still tells me I'm going to be saved from the wrath to come. Amen? Amen. Say, they, and they make this excuse, well, the second half's the worst. Yeah, it's the worst, but the first half is still something you don't want to go through. Read the first few seals and tell me you want to be here for that. The problem is people don't study their Bible. That's what we need to do. And these things are about to happen. You see, he's talking about those Old Testament prophecies. You realize the Old why let me help you with this why do we not see the rapture of the church mentioned in the Old Testament because they wasn't preaching to the church why doesn't Daniel talk about it because he wasn't prophesying to the church he was prophesying to the Jews that's why there's such a great gap between the 69th and the 70th week of Daniel 
Daniel only preached about or talked about things that dealt with the Jews. Why? Because his audience was the Jews. That's not rocket science. Listen, think of it like this. You can go out here to Mount Carlton and you can stand up on Mount Carlton and look towards Bathurst. Answer me this. Are you going to see every spot of land between Mount Carlton and Bathurst? No. What are you going to see? The peaks. You're not going to see the valleys, amen? Daniel prophesied about the peaks. He didn't see the valleys. He couldn't tell you what was happening in the valley. In the valley was that span, as Christ calls it here, the times of the Gentiles. All Daniel saw is what was going to happen with the Jews. You might say to yourself, and someone might say, well, he talked about when uh, the king of the north went against the king of the south. That wasn't about the Jews. Oh, wait, stop a second. How did the king of the north get to the king of the south? He went through Israel. Israel, listen, in those days they didn't come through saying, oh, here, we're going to leave you alone as we're going through. No, they pillaged as they went through. They battled as they went through. They conquered as they went through. And so as the king of the north went against the king of the south and then the south went against the north, there was always battles going on through Israel. So Israel was affected. He was still talking about Israel. And so we see from these passages, notice he continues in, in verse 27, 28 of Luke 21. And then shall they see the Son of Man coming. After all that, after the times of the Gentiles, after the tribulations and things that they're going to be going through, after the world's being shaken, the seals that I talked about, and we'll look at that stuff later. He said, Then, after that, then shall they see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. He's coming back, listen, as it talks about. King of kings and Lord of lords on his thighs. He's coming back, eyes uh, a flaming fire. A two-edged sword proceeding out of his mouth with which he slays the nations. They're seeing him come back. See, they're looking for someone to come with power and glory. Who's the they? Israel. The world. They're going to see him with power and glory. And when these things had begun to come to pass, then look up, lift up your heads... For your redemption draweth nigh. Who's he talking to? The Jews. He's saying when those things begin to happen, you need to pay attention because now your redemption draweth nigh. Remember, he's talking to the Jews. He's telling them at that point, listen, your king that you are looking for is coming. But it's all dealing with the Jews. You see, they, they misinterpret this because they are applying it to the Gentiles. Remember, he said right in this passage, the times of the Gentiles, right? That means he's not talking to the Gentiles. Hello? He didn't say the times of you all. He said the times of the Gentile. Why? Because he was speaking to Jews. Be careful in how you interpret and apply passages. You have to understand who he's addressing, who he's speaking to. 
He was speaking to Jews. Listen, that's how we get past or, or get this thing messed up um, with all these gifts of healing and stuff. Because we take it and, and people try to take it and apply that to the church. When if you read Matthew chapter 10, he expressly tells them, that's where he sends his disciples out two by two, he expressly tells them, take this not into the way of the Gentiles. Hello, if you're a Gentile, it's not for you. Christ specifically says it, but the world ignores it, and we have all these healing services. And these healers. Hey, he says not even to take it to the Jer uh, Samaritans. That's the half-breeds. The Jew-Gentile mix. Why? Because there's Gentile blood in it. He said don't even take it to them. Why? Because the Bible says the Jews require a sign. He does not, the Bible does not say the world requires a sign. It says the Jews require a sign. And the Greek seeketh after knowledge. You have all the knowledge you here need right here. You do not need the sign. Right here is your sign. If you don't believe that, listen, you're, you're just like uh, the rich man's brother. Remember what Abraham told uh, the rich man? Hey, they have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. They won't even he if they won't even hear them, they won't believe even if someone come back from the dead. In other words, they won't even believe if they won't believe the word, they won't believe it even if they saw a sign. You see, there's specific things that's been occurring over the last several years. Think about this statement. In, in February of 2010, Benjamin Netanyahu made this statement. He said, Ezekiel 37 has been fulfilled. Remember the passage, the Valley of the Dry Bones? They've been brought back to life. That's been fulfilled. You see, Jews even know the Old Testament better than we do, and we have it also. They see the signs of the times. They're looking, they're understanding things are getting close. They have no doubt about that. In May of 1948, Israel became a state again. Think about that. 1,878 years of not having a nation. The Valley of the Dry Bones come back to life. They reclaimed Jerusalem in the 1967 war. Consider this. They're surrounded on all sides by people that want to see them destroyed. I don't care what some of them other nations, Jordan and stuff, are saying. When you read the Quran, if you ever take the notion to, you better have some good spiritual sense before you do it. You'll see some things. In the second chapter of the Quran, they... The Quran is broke up. It's not like the Bible where you have books and then chapters and verses. Okay? The Quran is one book with chapters and verses, like most other books in the world. Okay? In the second chapter, verse 190 and through 193, the Bible or the Quran says, "And fight in the way of Allah against those who fight against you." But be not aggressive. Surely Allah loves not the aggressor. And kill them wherever you find them. Do you not see a contradiction there? Yeah. 
Allah loves not the aggressor, but kill them wherever you find them. Drive them out from where they drove you out. Hey, that's talking about Jordan. 1967, they got drove out of Jerusalem. He says, drive them out. And by the way, they're trying to kick the Jews back out of it, or Jer Jerusalem. And persecution is worse than slaughter. And fight not with them at the sacred mosque until they fight with you in it. So if they fight with you in it, slay them. Such is the recompense of disbelievers. Hey, that's the reward of disbelievers. You need to die. Hey, they say Islam is a loving, nonviolent. This is right out of the Quran. It sounds like to me they're commanded to kill disbelievers. But if they desist, in other words, if they repent, if they change their mind about Allah, then surely Allah is forgiving, merciful. And fight them until there is no persecution. In other words, fight the disbelievers. And what's he calling fighting? Remember, keep it in its context, killing them. Until there's no more disbelievers. Or no more persecution. Well, when's that going to be? When everything else that's not Muslim is destroyed. And they call themselves nonviolent? Come on. This is not rocket science. This is just reading out of the Quran. But if they desist, then there should be no hostilities except against the oppressor. Anyone that's not a believer is an oppressor. Why? Why can they do that? Why is Muslims going on, on the TVs and the radios and the newspapers and everything saying, that's not true, that's not the way it is? Because in chapter 4, verses 88 and 89 says, Why should you then be two parties in relation to to the hypocrites while Allah has made them return to disbelief for what they have earned do you desire to guide him whom Allah leaves in error in whomsoever Allah leaves in error thou canst not find a way for him they long that they should disbelieve as they have disbelieved so that you might be on the same level. He's saying they're wanting to bring you down. Yeah, I want to bring them down to our level. I want to see them get saved. So take not from among them friends until they flee their home in Allah's way. They're telling them, don't take you friends of anybody that's not a believer in Islam unless they convert to Islam. That's what they're told. That's what the Quran says. Then if they turn back to, host to hostility, what's hostility? When they're turning back away from the Bible, seize them, kill them, wherever you find them, and take no friend nor helper from among them. When people get saved out of Islam, they have a bounty on their head. A good Muslim is going to seize them and not whip them, not persecute them. He says seize them and kill them. Why do you think Muslims that convert are fearful for their life? Because anybody that truly reads the Bible, you say, well, why isn't that happening more? This is the basics of it, okay? You hear me talk about all the time the liberals we have in Christianity that are truly not saved, right? 
those that don't know what the Bible truly teaches. Right? You have those in Islam that has no clue what the Quran says. They say what they want it to mean. And by the way, they are, and I forget where exactly it is, I read it before, but they are told if, it, if they are going to be persecuted, harmed, or anything, that it's okay to lie. And it's okay to lie to advance the Quran. So you, I'll be honest with you, those ones that saying that Islam is not like it, I don't know what's going on. I don't know if they just don't know it or if they're lying. Because they're given a free pass to lie. But notice what they also say about what you believe. In the same chapter, chapter 4, in verses 157 through 155, or 155, uh, I'm going backwards. 157 through 159 says this, And for their saying, we have killed the Messiah, Jesus, son of Mary. You know they believe in the Jesus, son of Mary? They sure do, but it's not the way you think it is, and it's not what they say. The messenger of Allah... He, they don't believe he's the son of God. They think he's a messenger of Allah. He's a prophet. And they killed him not. Hey, if he didn't die, he didn't resurrect. And your sins have not been forgiven, according to the Bible. They believe that they killed him not. Nor did they cause his death on the cross. But he was made to appear to them as such. In other words, they're saying he just appeared like he was dead. He wasn't really dead. He was faking it. And certainly those who differ therein are in doubt about it. In other words, those that say he died, they don't really believe it. This is the, what the Quran says. They have no knowledge about it, but only follow a conjecture. And they killed him not for certain. It's saying they definitely did not kill him. Nay, Allah exalted him in his presence. Allah is ever mighty and wise. What they say is... Okay, I read a little bit of the commentary on this today. And they say that, listen, those times that they saw him, or they saw him after what was supposed to be the rapture, he didn't die. He was in hiding from them. That's why he was always seeing him in this place. Now, I think the last time they seen him, he was at the seashore. And that was not in hiding. But they say he was in hiding because he didn't really die. And what really happened is that Allah brought him up. And he's with Allah. That's what that last part is talking about. And that one day he's going to be coming back. Remember, they said in here, he's a messenger of Allah, right? He's coming back. And he's going to make the world take Islam or die. That's what they teach. Hey, who does that sound like? It sounds like the false prophet of the Bible. during the tribulation period. You see, Islam, and I'm going to preach a message on it uh, during, a sizzy, during the series, Islam is Christianity upside down. I'm going to be quoting from the Quran and showing you what the Bible says and showing you the relationship, how, listen, they teach in the Quran about the Lord in his ways and talking about how the Lord's coming and fighting with them and talking about what we call the beast and the false prophet and stuff but they're putting their twist on it that it is a positive and what's positive about the Holy Spirit and everything on 
the Bible side is made to look negative in the Quran. Now understand this. The Quran was written, I believe, in the 6th century. 525, I think, is when it was started. Don't you think that Satan knew the Bible, knew the prophecy of the book of Revelation, and he found a sucker and said, Listen, I'm going to take what the Bible says, and I'm going to turn it around and create my own religion. And it's going to take and feed off of what the Bible says to make people believe it's true. But it, it cannot be like the Bible. You see, I, I think Satan, he knows what the Bible says, that he's going to be defeated. But I think there's still that glimmer of hope in him that he thinks he's going to win. Why? Because he's already been defeated multiple times throughout the centuries. He's been kicked out of heaven. He still has to report to God. But he was still arrogant enough to think and say, I will be like the Most High. I will ascend above the heavens. In other words, he, he believed, he said, I'm going to ascend above God. That's recorded in Isaiah. So I think he still has a glimmer of hope. And his hope is in his religion. And, and whatever you want to think about it, I believe his main religion is Islam. I want you to consider something. We'll look at this later too. In, in the book of Revelation, the Bible talks about the saints that are in heaven crying out to God and saying, How long? How long? How did those saints die? The Bible clearly says they were beheaded for Christ. Tell me something. Who today, who today is beheading people? The Muslims. Oh, it's not just ISIS. ISIS is just putting a, a big flashing sign on it. But there was people in Islam long before ISIS showed up on the scene beheading people. That's their prime way of killing people. You're going, to, you're going to see. Listen, if you come with an open mind, I, I'm going to show you a lot of things that you've never seen before and help you to realize what the Bible teaches. We're going to look at, at all the Old Testament passages concerning these end-time events. And we're going to look at all these things. I don't know if how many of you have ever heard that Russia's mentioned in the Bible or Germany's mentioned in the Bible. Listen, it's a lie. I used to believe that. But I finally got a little common sense about me and realized, hey, the places they were talking about in the Bible, in the Old Testament, were literal places. Amen? They knew where they were when they mentioned them. And so there must be a place on a map where we can find them. Amen? And listen, once I did the study and looked, and I'm going to give you a map and show you all this, once you see it on the map, you're going to realize they're all in, guess what, Muslim nations right now. Every city that is mentioned in the Old Testament concerning end-time events is in a Muslim nation right now. And it's those cities that come against God's people. And so we're going to be looking at a lot of different things and you're going to get, a, hopefully, a more clear and biblical view because 